All right, yeah, there's obviously no warm up today because we've got the quiz coming up. So, but we probably still should do a little bit of review of um, what we've been covering. So again, last, last class, we were diving into kind of the immune system. And we talked about how we were kind of splitting it up into different categories or different divisions, just like we, we tend to always categorize things. That's kind of what we do. What were the two main divisions in the immune system that we first mentioned? Innate and specific. Exactly, innate and specific. And innate also called kind of general defenses. Specific is also called adaptive defenses. Um, this is where we were, we spent a lot of time looking at innate. We looked at just macrophages and phagocytes that eat things. We looked at inflammation. We looked at complement. We looked at pyrogens, things that, no, endogenous pyrogens, I should say, things that create fever. Um, we looked at natural killer cells that poke holes in things that don't look right, or your own cells that are malfunctioning. Um, thing about innate, though, it's looking for more gen general things, like cells that have a marker on them that would never be on a human body cell, or you know, even broader, just like barriers, like the mucus and skin and things like that. Um, specific, on the other hand, that's what we're going to spend a little more time focusing on to kind of finish things up this morning before we move on and dig deeper into the digestive system. What were, we talked about three main characteristics of specific, also known as adaptive immunity. They have memory. One is they have memory. It's like once you have been exposed to a particular antigen, you create memory cells. And if you ever see that same antigen again, you're going to have a much faster and stronger response. Again, that's how we get immunity. That's how, that's what vaccines are taking advantage of. They expose you to this particular looking thing. So if your body ever encounters that something that looks like that again, you'll just womp on it and you won't get sick. Um, what's another characteristic of specific or adaptive immunity? It's systemic. Uh, systemic. Systemic. Doesn't matter where in your body your immune system first encounters a particular antigen. You know, once you set up the response, you're protected wherever it tries to enter again. So, you know, you're going to be sending out all these different lymphocytes and spewing out antibodies and they'll be just going all over the place and be prepared for any breach of the system. And then the last and probably most important or most you know defining quality as well of specific or adaptive immunity. Antigen specific. It is antigen specific. It is always going to recognize a very particular shape. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit right now is how do you create cells that are only gonna recognize something that looks like a coronavirus or something that looks like this or that. Um, and it's a little, it's, it's little non-intuitive, which is another reason why it's worth going into. Um, so, we're going to do that. Are there before we kind of get deeper into specific or adaptive immunity? Are there any questions or points of clarification about anything we talked about last last time? Like right, any of that could end up on your quiz as well. Yeah, the quiz is up to last class. It's not this new stuff will not be on the quiz. All right. So what we're going to talk about now is how does the adaptive immune system actually create a 
response and armies of cells that all recognize one particular um, antigen. So again, it's a little non-intuitive. What happens is your body creates lymphocytes that have receptors that are randomly generated that can recognize all sorts of different things. So this is, you know, before encountering the antigen, encountering any antigen. Again, antigen, antibody generating, it's just the thing that you're gonna have the response to. So before encountering the antigen, you just make a bunch of lymphocytes. So these are, let's make it easy. Let's make this be a B lymphocyte right now. And it's got some receptor on it that recognizes, let's say this one recognizes things that look like that. And we're gonna have a whole bunch of B lymphocytes all floating around that have been created already. Maybe this one recognizes things that looks like that. This one recognizes things that look like that. Um, this thing recognizes things that, um, well, looks like that. This one recognizes things that look like that. So these are all kind of randomly generated receptors. Right, so this is kind of like, remember we talked about in uh, antibody, it has that end that can perfectly bind a, some particular shape is kind of that complement. So this, these are here, they've just been generated by this kind of random algorithm in the protein synthesis with these variable regions that just randomly makes these shapes. These haven't bound with anything. The thing that they might meet with might not ever exist. These are just kind of, Basically, let's you know, it's like, let's get a pair of scissors and cut out something and let's make that shape. All right, oh, that's a cool shape. Let's put that out in the world. Oh, there's another cool shape. Let's put that out in the world. So this is not done with any like intention of I know what, the sh what I need the shape to be. It's just like, let's just make random shapes and throw them out there. Um, in this process, you need to make sure that you don't send out any of these that will bind to your own tissues. So part of when we talked about B cells mature in the bone marrow and T cells mature in the thymus gland, part of that like maturing is weeding out any of these B lymphocytes that have receptors that would bind to your own tissues. So you've done, you've made sure that these are only gonna recognize something that aren't part of you. Because um, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. You're going to, I mean, obviously you'll end up with an autoimmune disease if you end up having a, having a immune response against your own tissue. All right. So then we've got all of these things just in circulation again before encountering any antigen. So now you know. Let's um. Let's say. Going on here we go. You know, in the interest of being topical, let's let this be a coronavirus with the little spike proteins on it. Or maybe it's actually going to be the um, spike proteins that you're getting from the vaccine, which are actually going to not be pathogenic, but will still trigger your immune system to do this whole process. So here's my antigen and I have, usually it's like a macrophage comes in. And this is gonna be an example of what we call an antigen presenting cell. And this macrophage eats this thing And we talked about that MHC2, which can present a little piece of something that it ate. So it's gonna eat this thing. 
and then it's going to have its little MHC2, which it's going to now And it's going to take a little piece and say, aha, here's this spike protein thing. Here's some distinctive shape that's part of this um, thing I ate that it wants to um, trigger an immune response to. So this is basically the little piece of the antigen that is going to be presenting to the other cells of the immune system to those lymphocytes so here this is the first step is this macrophage has been on patrol it's eaten this thing it now has set up this special little surface protein that's presenting a really defining identifying part of it and now it goes into over here we can like here it's coming in like rah, 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 rah. And it's got its little MHC2 with a little spike protein on it. So here's my antigen presenting cell. And hold well, on, this little thing shouldn't be there. Um, so at this point, At this point, all of these B lymphocytes with these different receptors are waiting in the wings. You know, and but look at this receptor. It doesn't match that. This one is not going to have any kind of response. This one is not going to be. Maybe another day, this one's going to be the savior and save your body from some infection if there's something that is invading that has that shape, but not today. Today, we're looking for something that can bind that particular shape this antigen is presenting. And it's like, you know, oh my God, this dude. He's the one who has the perfect receptor that matches that particular antigen that's being presented. And come on, little. There we, there we go. So this this is my little lymphocyte here. Here's my antigen presenting cell. This is the lymphocyte that randomly just happens to be the one out of tens of thousands that has the perfect shaped receptor to bind that antigen. And it also has the genetic information on how it made, you know, exactly how do you make this particular receptor. And at this point, there's this whole complicated activation and co-activation thing that happens. Your immune system is really careful not to activate unless it's really, 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 really sure that it's time to activate. Because otherwise you're going to end up with all sorts of horrible autoimmune diseases. So there's all this stuff called co-stimulation. Um, I'm We're not going to get any into the details of it at all. But basically this thing's talking to this and this is talking back to this. And there's actually helper T cells that are talking to both of them. So there's all this complicated um, interaction to actually know for sure this is what we want to do, that we're ready to activate this system. But assuming we are going to activate it, this T cell, this B cell, this lymphocyte has the code to make this receptor that binds this particular antigen. So Assuming all of this co-stimulation has gone properly, we are now going to enter what's called clonal selection. So this little B cell here that has the genetic information to make that particular receptor is going to start cloning itself and make big armies of cells that all have the code to make that particular shaped receptor.
So let's stay with the B cell. Let's, let's stay in the um, in the antibody um, antibody mediated immune system right now. But it's the same basic story for the um, T cells in the in the cell mediated. So we had our B cell, who was the guy with just the right receptor. And this is going to become two main armies of cells. One type of cell is going to become are these plasma cells. So these plasma cells, these are just a subtype of B lymphocyte, just to, to make that clear. You know, that manufactures antibodies. So basically, we're going to make these plasma cells that are basically antibody factories that are going to be spewing out antibodies out into your body that all recognize that exact same shape that we are saying is the thing that we want to capture. So each of these antibodies that's getting made is going to have that same receptor that's going to recognize that spike protein. So these plasma cells, these make maybe like 2,000 antibodies per second. They're really, they're, they're really just making antibodies that recognize that shape and just send them out into your system. Like when your glands are swollen, like you've got an infection and you know the swollen glands like under your neck or under your arms or what's happening there is just these plasma cells multiplying. You've got all these B lymphocytes dividing um, to become antibody factories to spew out antibodies into your, into your system. Those swollen glands are just but loads of plasma cells dividing and making antibodies to try to fight whatever thing they've been primed to recognize. So that is, again, here we're, we're right now we're looking at the antibody mediated side. We're looking at, right now we're looking at the B cell side. So B cell will differentiate into plasma cells, which make antibodies that recognize that thing that they are, that they are um, kind of primed to recognize. Again, these ones are recognizing the spike protein from, from the coronavirus, assuming. Um, and then there's another, another class of cells that gets kind of squirreled away for a rainy day, which are obviously going to be the memory cells. So we're going to make the plasma cells for the active infection right now, which are going to make antibodies that are going to go attack whatever this thing is. And then we're also going to make memory cells, cells that remember this template. So if you ever see this exact same antigen again, you're going to have the template ready to go to have your fast, strong immune response against whatever that thing is. So th th does that make sense? Dr. E, I have a question. Sure. Um, for the antibody mediated response, are we also going to look at um, like the helper T cells or are we just focusing on the B cells? Let's just focus on the B cells right now. Okay. Yeah, I will. I'll talk a little more about helper T cells when we get to the cell mediated. Um, but there's so it's it gets so complicated when you look at the more finer details of what's going on in here. So I want to kind of give you kind of a bird's eye view of the basic processes here. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so, but speaking of the cell mediated, let's just do that. We are going to come back to the antibodies because I want to talk a little more about how antibodies actually destroy their targets, right? How, how does sticking this little thing on the target actually destroy it? Because it's not so obvious at first. Um, but while we're here, let's, so we talked about antibody mediated. With the B cells and the B cells become the plasma cells, which make the antibodies. and memory cells, which remember what they found. So the T cells and the cell mediated, it's the same basic idea. There are going to be cells that have different receptors that end up getting activated by an antigen presenting cell and are going to create um, armies of cells. However, the armies of cells are pretty different. Well, not all different, but one of the types of cells that get made are called killer T cells. They're also called CD8 cells. CD8 just means like cell differentiation marker eight. Um, we're going to see there's other, there's going to be CD4 cells are going to be the helper T cells. Um, killer T cells are like the natural killer cells. They poke holes in their target. Um, the difference is that they only poke holes in cells they find that are dis, that are infected with the particular antigen they're looking for, right? Natural killer cells just killed things that looked wrong. Killer T cells are going to be looking at cells. Usually they're going to look at that MHC1 to see if a cell is infected with a virus, for instance. And the killer T cell can see by looking at that MHC1 that this cell is infected with the virus that it's looking for. And it, again, for the good of the herd, it's going to kill the infected diseased cell. And it does it by putting in these perforins, these um, things that poke holes in the cells. So these killer C's, they poke holes in the target cell. You know, using those perforins I talked about, it's kind of like the staves of a barrel. You put them in the membrane and they assemble into a tunnel. So killer T cells poke holes in your target cell and Again, like the natural killer T, not like, like the natural killers, except they're looking for a specific type of infection. They're, and again, we talked about, right, if I am some cell and I am infected with some, this is supposed to be the evil virus. You know, from the outside, it's hard to know what's going on. If you're just kind of looking, well, it looks like a cell. But because of that MHC1, we talked about MHC1. Let me write that. MHC1 displays a little piece of endogenous peptide. So some little piece of something that's inside the cell that like endogenous peptide fragment. So my killer T cell, which is coming around on patrol, you know, it's got its, its eyeball. It can see like, oh my God, I'm looking for this little beastie and I can see that that this cell must be infected with that little beastie because it's displaying a little chunk of it on this little presentation 
um, slot in the MHC1. So then that way this killer T cell knows that it has to go in and again for the good of the overall body start poking holes in this cell and getting it out of commission before it just lyses open and starts spreading viruses to the rest of the body. So the killer T cells are usually more about taking out your own cells that are too far gone. There's, it's not so much about necessarily killing the invader itself. Um, okay. So killer T cells, also known as CD8 cells. These are ones I was just mentioning. There are also the helper T cells. These are also called CD4 cells. These are necessary for the activation, actually, and not just of cell-mediated, but of antibody-mediated um, immunity as well. So these, these are necessary to activate both B and T cells. So, and again, don't worry about any of the details. It's a lot of it has to do with all of this um, co-stimulation, sending signals back and forth and everything. The main thing to know is helper T cells are important for making this whole system work so you get into this clonal selection and make the, all the rest of this happen. You know, in particular, you know, where this why it's important to know if that helper T cells are important for both sides. Is if something is affecting your helper T cells, your CD4 cells, it's going to affect your immune, you know, both, both segments of your immune system. You know, in particular, like HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. What it does is it attacks the helper T cells. And when you start taking out the helper T cells, you are gonna start impairing your both, both all parts of your immune response, specific immunity. So that might as well just, you know, HIV, let's, let's just do HIV real, just as a quick little aside human immunodeficiency virus. So by attacking CD4 cells, it's basically going to hamstring um, both divisions of your specific immunity, which wouldn't be such a problem if you could actually attack this and get rid of it and then you just get better but instead this is a type of virus that uses rna as its um, genetic material it mutates really fast so what happens is this hiv virus comes in and it looks like a certain way you know maybe Maybe it looks like this at first. And your immune system comes in, you know, it starts getting these CD4 cells, but then your immune system recognizes this and starts attacking it and starts taking it down. But during the course of the same infection, before you've already got rid of it, it mutates enough. So now all of a sudden, the surface protein looks a little different. And now, your immune system doesn't recognize it anymore and now it slips under the radar and it comes in and keeps fighting taking out your cd4 cells and then you can have an immune response against this but weakened because your cd4 cells are getting um, slashed and but before you actually get get it out of their system it mutates again and now it looks like this and now your immune system doesn't recognize it again 
And this keeps happening. It keeps sliding under the radar. And eventually, it has managed to completely dismantle your immune system. And now you are in what's called AIDS. You acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And now things that normally would land on you and wouldn't be a problem at all are starting to just be like fatal diseases. You, know, you start getting also, you know, a little yeast that would land in your mouth and your system would get rid of it. All of a sudden it's coating your whole inside of your mouth is all turning white and fuzzed out with thrush. And little things that would normally be a normal thing that you get rid of are creating all sorts of weird growths in your brain. And so HIV is really nasty because the particular cell it attacks is the very cell that is necessary to activate specific immunity. And at the same time, it keeps mutating like a chameleon. And every time your immune system thinks it's got a handhold on it, it slides under the radar and then comes back in and keeps slashing away at the base, you know, the kind of base of your immune system response. So, you know, the new drugs are kind of miraculous. They kind of go in and are able to stop the basic machinery that makes it do what it does. So, you know, years ago, it's basically a death sentence. And now people, you know, kind of live long, you know, healthy lives or healthy enough lives um, with it. Um, and even like, you know, you probably heard like PrEP, um, prophylactic, um, what is it? There's actually ways like if you, you know, people who have HIV can be in relationships with their partners, taking these prophylactic drugs that make it um, very unlikely that they are going to infect their partner with some some bad disease. So people with a HIV used to be a, it's still something you want to avoid, but it's not nearly what it used to be, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, but yeah, and this this whole thing of sliding under the radar, that's other things do that on a slow motion. That's like why you keep getting a cold every year. Right, the rhinovirus is still the same virus basically that gives you a cold, but it comes back a year later and its outer coating has mutated enough that your memory cells don't recognize it. Like if you ever see that exact same version of the cold or flu, you're on it. But the problem is that the flu and the cold viruses have these variations as they come back year after year. So your immunity or memory cells aren't doing you as much good as you'd wished. Okay. So killer T cells. Yeah, so let's go back. I went on a little bit of a tangent here. Cell mediated the T cell division. You make killer T cells as part of the clonal selection. Again, so this is all clonal selection. Once you find the cell that has that particular template, you can make killer T cells. Um, and obviously you're gonna make memory cells as well, memory T cells. This is so ugly here, let me. memory cells so you have just like the b cells have memory cells the t cells have memory cells um and others there are other things like suppressor t cells and this and that i mean and the reality i will say is we constantly keep adjusting our understanding of how all of this works like the big picture as i'm describing it to you is basically a it seems to be about what's happening. The details of how it all works, you know, is still, it's, it's so complicated. Um, you know, and the details of, you know, whether or not things, if you see something more and more, whether you get more, um, 
reactive to it and get worse and worse like an anaphylaxis or whether or not you actually get more habituated to it and you don't actually respond to it as much it's kind of tricky to know which direction things are going to go and why things go in one direction or another why some people get more activated versus some people get less activated if they have repeated exposures to the same thing um so does college of marin offer immunology i don't ever? think so no i think in micro they go more into this but i think it's more of a kind of grad you know you know upper division graduate level because you know community college officially is lower division um these pre-nursing classes are the only classes i think i know of in in the curriculum that actually articulate with upper division um, classes outside of but in general you know you use community college as a place to do more lower division and the more advanced classes tend to be more at the four-year colleges um but yeah immunology is really incredibly like, interesting and complicated and you know obviously incredibly useful as well the more you can understand it, the more you can try to figure out ways to help people. Um, okay. So any questions about any of that? Okay, so what I wanna do now is talk a little more about antibodies and how they actually target their um, their target for destruction. So how antibodies can destroy their target. Um, and there are, can destroy or neutralize, I should say, destroy or neutralize. And there's three main ways we talk about. Um, one is, we say fix complement. This basically kind of activates that complement cascade. If you remember, complement was something we talked about when we did the general defenses, but I said it's called complement because it complements different aspects of immunity. Does anyone remember the three hallmarks of complement? Membrane attacking complex. Yep, the membrane attack complex. How about another one? Opsonizes. Opsonizes. The target. The target, target, right? So again, that's going to put little, basically like handles, so to speak. So the phagocytes that are around are going to be able to grab, notice it, grab onto it, and eat it easy. And the last was it intensifies inflammation. But so you can imagine, you know, if, you know, I am the target and antibody, some little sticky wicket lands on me and I'm like, oh, I'm so scared. This little thing just stuck on me, whatever. But then all of a sudden, this complement cascade activates and all of a sudden there's holes start opening up and my gut starts spilling out. And then all of a sudden the phagocytes come in, these big amoebas come in and start grabbing me and pulling me in and eating me, right? So all of a sudden things don't look so good, even though the antibody itself is, you know, seems relatively harmless, but it's, it's kind of 
you know, turning on this other thing, which is not harmless at all. Um, another thing that we have is called neutralization. Neutralization is when you basically block um, important um, sites on the target that it needs to do its job. Like for, I mean, a big, a big example of this is the vaccine for coronavirus. The coronavirus is going to make antibodies that bind onto the spike protein. Um, and when the coronavirus antibodies bind to the spike protein, the coronavirus gets up to your cells, but the spike protein can't actually latch onto the ACE receptor and get in and do its thing. So neutralization is basically kind of, kind of block important sites on target. Um, an example, like if I'm doing more of this kind of you know, analogy of me as the thing, it's like, okay, there's, again, that little sticky wicket landed on me, again, woo, I'm so scared, but all of a sudden, they're landing all over my hands, and now I can't, I can't use my hands, because my fingers are all gummed up, and now they're in my eyes, I can't even see where I'm at, right, so all of a sudden, it actually is a real problem, because I can't actually maneuver and do the things I need to do, because they're getting in the way and getting stuck in between my fingers and down my, my nose or wherever. And now all of a sudden they actually are a real problem. So neutralization, they can get and block important binding sites on the target so the target can no longer you know, do its thing to make you sick. Um, it doesn't even have to be a pathogen like rattlesnake antivenom. If you ever get bit by a rattlesnake, the rattlesnake antivenom is actually an antibody that binds the rattlesnake venom molecule and blocks important sites on it so it no longer like is proteolytic doesn't start breaking down all of your proteins and make your tissue fall apart right so neutralization gum basically gums up the works so the target can't do its job um and then three You've met already agglutination. You know, because each antibody has more than one receptor on it. Remember, we saw the ones that looked like little um, Ys. Minimally, they look kind of like this. So, you know, if this is my target here, this one's getting grabbed and this one's getting grabbed and then another antibody is coming in and grabbing that one and then grabbing yet another one here. So all of these things start getting all held together in this big clump, which makes, makes it so they can't go and do their thing and also makes them all corralled so the phagocytes can come in and just eat them all. So it's basically like kind of like old Wild West you know, round up the round, round up all the pathogenic targets and corral them and take care of them. You know, if they were cows, you'd send them off, turn them into hamburger or whatever. Um, so that's agglutination. So, <clears throat> so if we go back here. That is how something as unassuming as a little sticky wicket known as an antibody can actually be so lethal. You know, the complement, neutralization, all that. Um, I will briefly describe, there's different versions of antibodies. Um, they all are the same basic idea in that they have this fixed and variable region, they bind their antigen, but there are different versions of antibodies um, with slightly different forms. Some of them are little things that just look like that, like I showed you. Some of them are actually 
these pentamers where you actually have five connected up back to back, kind of these really like, a, I don't know if you, we actually called it sticky wickets when I was a kid, this thing with little suction cups all around it and you throw it against the wall and it would stick, it was fun. Um, but so there's different versions of these antibodies and the um, mnemonic people use is MADGE. Um, I always think of those old commercials for palm olive dish soap. I don't know if those even exist anymore. It's like, you know, why Madge? I'm soaking my fingers in dishwashing soap. Wow. Um, or I don't know. I always think of her. Sounds like somebody serving you coffee at a truck stop or something. I don't know. For whatever way you got to, if you remember that name, it's not such a common name, but it's it's useful for remembering types of antibodies. So and antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. Um, and they're also called gamma globulins. the gamma globulins. So the ones that you should be aware of in particular, one is called IgM. IgM is distinguished as it is usually the one that's released upon first exposure to an antigen. Remember when I was showing you that thing about first and second response? The first time you ever see an antigen and you have your very first response, you're going to make IgM, and that's going to be the antibody that's going off into the body. If you see the same antigen a second time, and it's the memory cells that are initiating the response, then it's a different version of antibody that gets released called IgG. Right? So this is like if you're immune to something and you see it again, or if, if just you have memory and you see it again, you're going to release a slightly different version. Um, and this is actually useful. You can actually use this to kind of get information. Like somebody comes in presenting with herpes and you want to know, did they just catch this from their current partner right now? Or maybe they actually had it for a while and they missed when it first, you know, can they just thought they had a flu. They didn't actually realize they had herpes and then it went into kind of a dormant stage. And now this is just a flare up of a, of a herpes infection that they actually caught a while ago. You can actually look what kind of antibodies are currently high in their body as they're fighting this current infection. If it's IgM, you know that they just caught it. This is the first time they're fighting it. If it's IgG, you know that they actually caught it a while ago, and this is just a flare-up of something that's just been dormant, but already in their body. So IgM, um, when I try to remember these, I think of like Spanish of like, um, you know, primero is with an M, like the first, first exposure, and like segundo, G with the G for the second exposure. Um, you know, whatever works for you, but that always helps me, like primero and segundo. Um, other ones you should know, you should know IgA.
this is in secretions, mucus, etc. Secretory IgA, right? So, you know, when you have that mucus, we talked about it being sticky as part of the way it's a part of your defenses, like all the mucus lining your mucus membranes. Then we said, oh, it's even more intense. It's got the lysozyme, that bacteriolytic um, enzyme that breaks apart bacterial cell walls. So it's even more than just sticky. It's like breaking down the bacteria. And it's even worse for the targets because it's also got antibodies that are also secreted in there that could recognize and bind anything that the antibodies are programmed to bind to. So secretory IgA, that's also what is being secreted in mother's breast milk. Like when you're getting your like passive immunity from nursing, you're getting it from the secretory IgA from your mom who's, you know, producing this and secreting it into the breast milk again, because it's a, a secretion. The milk is just modified sweat, basically. Um, there are the other ones you don't, you know, there's Ig, IgE which is often implicated in allergies and stuff. I don't know so much about it. Um, there's IgD, which is a specialized one that's only involved, only found on certain um, lymphocytes involved in kind of more regulation of the immune system. So, but you should, IgM, IgG, IgA definitely are commonly referred to. You should have a basic sense of what they are. Well, speaking of allergy, IgE, al allergy is basically, in fact, we can, we'll end this with just some basic like problems that can occur with the immune system. Allergy. You know, what is an allergy? Overreaction of the immune system? Exactly. It's an overreaction of the immune system. Your immune system gets primed to respond to something that is not actually going to actually make you sick, like pollen or cat dander or something like that, but you do have a reaction against it. And part of that reaction is inflammatory response. Um, you know, again, the pollen or the cat dander comes in and all of a sudden your eyes turn red and your nose gets all red and runny and all of that. So allergies, you know, asthma is a little more of a serious version of an allergy where you have allergies that cause your, um, bronchial passages to constrict um, and make it harder to breathe in and out. So allergies are kind of like this overreaction of your immune system to something that shouldn't be a problem. Um, there are auto, more severe autoimmune diseases. These happen when you're, that I talked about, is this, do I still have, I still have. And I talked about back in this original slide here where we have all of our little T cells that are being produced with all these random receptors just waiting for is it going to be my time when I become the hero and have the right program, the right receptor template to save the day? But you have to make sure that you take out any of these that might actually bind to your own tissues and create a response against your own tissue. You know, in the autoimmune diseases, unfortunately, that's kind of exactly what's happened. You have an immune response against your own tissue. 
Um, it might be against my, your own myelin and you start demyelinating your central nervous system. And now your sensory and motor signals are no longer going where they need to get. Or it might be um, attacking your synovial membranes and your joints. And now all of a sudden, all of your joints are getting inflamed and starting to like hard to move at all. Or it might be a more generic thing like lupus, where it's just all your organs start getting inflamed and irritated due to being attacked by your own immune system. So there's a whole bunch of different autoimmune diseases that can happen. Um, some of these digestive um, diseases are similar too. Um, another common one is graft versus host disease. This is when you get an organ transplant. You know, you need a new kidney or a new heart or a new whatever, and somebody's willing to give you a donated organ. But again, their MHC and your MHC are not identical. So your immune system is always going to see this other tissue as a stranger. And again, if it's close enough, you won't have that strong of a response and you can keep your immune system suppressed with immunosuppressant drugs. Although that also means you're more likely to get diseases from other things because you're depressing your overall immune system. You're not suppressing just for this one particular organ. Um, but you know, if you try to give somebody an organ from somebody who is genetically quite different from you, it's just all over. Your body is just going to go in and womp it and attack it and take it out. So graft versus host disease. This is why it's way better. People have been looking so much into trying to grow organs from your own tissues. So you have an organ that you could transplant into you that's actually made from your own original cells. So your immune system will just accept it as its own. Um, what other things do I want to say? Um, oh, diabetes, diabetes, type one diabetes, where you attack your own little islets of Langerhans and then no longer make the insulin. That's autoimmune. Um, when I should, I should mention, Aunt, when we're talking about allergies, you know, allergies can be annoying. Allergies can be really terrifying, like in asthma. We should talk about anaphylaxis. Anaphylactic shock. Um, this is kind of like a systemic allergic reaction. You know, and basically part of inflammation, we talked about vasodilation. You've got vasodilation all over your body. Your blood pressure is going to drop, plummet. You're not going to be able to be pushing blood around to all your tissues. Um, so you need to respond really fast to save this person's life. And this can be from like, you know, I talked about this. It can be this weird, we don't, it could be the first time you ate shrimp, you just had like an allergic reaction, but then got hypersensitized to it. And now the second time you're eating shrimp, you know, everything's going. Um, people, hopefully people know if they actually have this severe allergies to any particular thing. What do you want to carry around if you know that this is a potential outcome of being exposed to some allergen for you? EpiPen. Yeah, this is where you have the old EpiPen, a little pen filled with epinephrine, you know, adrenaline that you can just jam into their leg and bring their blood pressure back up through, you know, kind of just, we know that epinephrine is going to speed up their heart and vasoconstrict and do everything we need to kind of bring their blood pressure back up in an instant. So, you know, anaphylaxis is really dangerous because like remember we talked about shock is like you are no longer being able to um, perfuse your tissues with adequate blood um so we need to have some ways to bring your pressure back up and get things running again 
um, allergies. All right. So what would be the difference between an allergy and consuming something that's poisonous or like a snake bite? So let's see, yeah, it's the snake bite, there's some actual toxic molecule that is interacting with your body to destroy things. Um, like, you know, rattlesnake venom is starts breaking down proteins in your body. Um, other other venoms are like bind receptors and paralyze nerve transmissions, um, things like that. So there's some molecule that is interacting directly to cause, you know, cause a problem. These um, immune, an allergy is your immune system is the problem. It is seeing something that it's deciding warrants a, an immune response and therefore degranulating mast cells, which cause, you know, release histamine and causing inflammation. So, you know, that pollen grain or that little, you know, cat dandruff or whatever could land up your nose and it wouldn't do anything bad. It would just sit there and eventually get swept out. But it's your immune system cells that are the actual problem. They are the ones saying like, oh my God, cat dander, better like, you know, trip all the alarms and create this big response that is super unpleasant where my eyes are itchy and red and I'm sneezing and everything, if that makes sense. Got it, thanks. Um, all right, so, so any questions about all of that? You know, there is a lot to the immune system. Um, and like I said, it is a work in progress. There are some things that we understand pretty well. The immune system, I would say, is very much kind of on this kind of leading edge of what we are trying to understand in biology and physiology and all that. Um, you know, it's, there's so many moving parts to it, so much interacting cells and signaling molecules and um, extenuating circumstances that affect how it works and the interaction with your non-self cells that are part of you, like in your gut biota. Um, it's so complicated trying to figure out exactly how it works and how to make it work properly and how to fix it when something's going wrong um, and why it goes wrong, why some person gets um, multiple sclerosis at all and why some person gets it and it just kind of gets a little bad and get better a little bad and better another person gets it and they get worse and worse and they're dead um you know it's we we don't know so it's it's frustrating um okay i should i don't know my if you guys get a chance i actually had that opportunity i was up in yosemite last weekend and it's crazy beautiful there's like dogwoods wherever you look it's just dogwoods blooming. It's like if somebody just like took like the dogwood, dogwood font and just sprayed it everywhere you looked. It's just, it's crazy pretty. Um, 